Welcome to Real Estate Milestones, where we explore fascinating topics in commercial real estate with knowledgeable industry experts. I'm your host, Ben Malik, and I'm a young real estate professional who is passionate about adding value to people's lives through the incredible power of real estate. My goal is to help you discover what the heck is going on in the industry and how you can get involved. This is Real Estate Milestones, where your future in real estate lies just around the corner. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Real Estate Milestones. Today, we have Andrew Esposito, who is a New York City developer. He's starting taking on his own ventures in the, in the business, but he has pretty cool track into the industry. So I'm excited to, to chat. Andrew, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Ben. Great intro. Looking forward to being here and happy to have you know, newly, newly met, met you and hear about what you're doing and looking forward to building that relationship. Awesome. So let's start with, with the first question we always ask on the show. What's your first milestone in real estate? Sure. I think, you know, it's a good way to kick off the conversation because I would say as a, as a reasonably young guy at 34, um, breaking into the business was a challenge and, and having reached that uh, achievement gave me the stepping stone to then do what I've been able to do in the business. Um, it's a little bit of what I've spoken to you about in, in some of our networking conversations, you know, with, with you heading into that direction now coming out of Tulane. Um, and, you know, it was a Fordham undergrad uh, summa cum laude, I did really well academically, St. John's Law after that, knew that I wasn't going to practice law, wanted to have the background, have, you know, family attorneys similar to I know that you do. Um, and I was, you know, again, excelled academically, thought I was going to come out and walk into a, a development shop or, you know, a read or, or what have you. And it was extremely challenging. So it required a ton of networking for the better part of Going on two years after graduating St. John's, I was back in 2016. Um, and after one, two, three, 10, 20, you know, um, they, you know, not job interviews, but networking uh, conversations, whether it was coffee, phone calls, Zooms, what have you, you know, and hearing sort of that common refrain of, you know, you sound great and you're really smart and you have these great backgrounds, but you don't really know how to do this yet. Um, and my response was, well, give me the shot, you know, Give me that opportunity to learn. Um, and it was that that's what was really hard to find. It took, you know, to find the right opportunity to be, again, on the principal side. So there was opportunities in brokerage, in, in you know, legal, of course, um, tangential uh, aspects to development. But I knew that I wanted to be on the principal side specifically and uh, sort of networking my way into the right opportunity was in some ways the pinnacle, even though it was the beginning of my career, because I knew that I was intelligent, that I was hardworking, that I would, you know, excel at it, but it was, it was having someone give me a, give me a shot. Um, and that's something that to this point, and, you know, I've had other obviously accomplishments that we'll chat a little bit about, but that was one that sort of started the whole thing off. So I find that to be super relevant for this conversation. Absolutely. I want to linger on that a little bit because there's obviously this, um, I guess maybe it's a misconception that, you know, having a strong academic background, you know, you're, you're set, you, I guess on paper, you're the, the ideal person coming out of college that, and especially, you know, I guess a lot of people going into like consulting and investment banking, it's on this cyclical nature. It's like every, you know, every fall you get this big class of rotational analysts. And it's like, you know, the people with the high, the best academic track record do this job, but you, like you knowing that you wanted to do something different, it might first, the first idea might be, okay, well, you know, I'm now I'm not competing with those people anymore. I'm competing in a league of my own. I got this academic track record that's strong. And then you get to this point where like you think you could walk into a development development shop and add a lot of value. And then you face the reality of, you know, development and real estate is not as uh, not as cyclical as, as the those big businesses. So I guess I want to linger a little bit on that to kind of address this idea that people might be having going to real estate. Yeah. Um, you know, like maybe thinking a little differently. So I want to hear how no, you. It's a, it's a good, it's a good observation. And for, you know, for students or someone potentially transitioning careers, um, it, I would stress doing whatever you can to get experiences to work in different real estate related businesses or industries, even if it's not development, because that's sort of the gold standard that, it, well, you know, depending upon your interest, but that many, many folks try to get to. Um, and the reality is that I found there was sort of one of two buckets that developers fell into the really big boys, the related, the Excels, the Tishmans of the world where they're looking for target schools and, you know, really solid background in a certain area. Typically they're hiring analysts who are, you know, just pounding through Excel models all day and you got to be effectively an investment banker 
you know, with, with the specialization in real estate, I didn't have that. Um, or sort of the smaller mid market, more nimble type of developers. And those guys just don't hire a lot because they tend to run really lean shops. Um, so, so, you know, while networking super relevant there and, and you might make good contacts, the timing's not always right. And that's what happened to me when I, you know, was making some of those relationships, even the first developer I ended up starting with where I worked for several years and got a ton of experience from the day that I, you know, started my first day of work from the day that I had met that person was, as I mentioned, over a year, year and a half, maybe going on two um, worth of initiating a relationship, developing a relationship without being an enormous pain in somebody's ass who's really busy. But, you know, a checkup every now and then a conversation about an experience in real estate I was having or somebody else in the industry who we had met in common and staying on the person's radar. Um, so, yeah, I, I worked really hard. I made the mistake in college and undergrad um, of thinking that if I had straight A's, I could just go do whatever I want and make a lot of money and life would be great. And I quickly found that there are a lot of intelligent people out there who have good grades, especially if you're not at a, like a, a true target school. And I went to Fordham, you know, business school, which was really solid and you're at Tulane, which is solid. Um, you know, so I had straight A's at, at a school like Fordham, but you're coming out and you're competing for those jobs that the top guys at the top Ivy league schools are competing for. And even if you're a valedictorian, which I mentioned to you, I was in my law school. It's like, you know, okay, there's a lot of really smart guys competing for this. What's different about you? That was more so among the more institutional corporate type shops, which ironically, and, and I guess conveniently for me, um, that's not the path I wanted to head towards. So it's really not what I pursued, although I did some networking in that space for sure. I knew that I wanted to be you know, a little bit more of a scrappy, gritty, kind of boots on the ground, mid-market type developer where I wear a lot of hats and have a lot of different experiences. Um, so yeah, I mean, working hard is super important, academic background, in my opinion. Um, although a lot of developers, especially in New York City, but, but everywhere I'd imagine, have colorful backgrounds and a lot of these guys didn't go to college. I mean, Steve Roth and the, some of the stories are just are, are fascinating. The, the story with, about Sam Zell, how he went to law school and practiced law for like two days and decided that, you know, there's no competitive advantage in practicing law. So he became a real estate developer. Um, so many interesting, like, and colorful people in background. But for what we can control, guys like us, um, is just work really hard. If that means in a school setting to begin with, because, you know, that, that's the, the path that your life takes you in. Uh, certainly work hard, but net, couple that with networking and experiences, whether it be internships, free, paid, doesn't matter. Um, so that's what I'd suggest about that. Yeah, and I guess to linger on it a little longer, the fact that you, you know, graduated at the top of your class at law school, you know, you could have probably gotten a $200,000 a year high paying job in a prestigious law firm, but knowing that you didn't want to necessarily go that round, that route, yep. it's got to be pretty, um, I guess, humbling to, you know, accept less than the standards. Like, oh, like, it, it might feel like you're wasting your degree to not be going to this big corporation. Like sometimes it feels like there might be a progress. Oh, I have this college degree. Why would I go do something that a hard worker who doesn't have a college degree might be able to do also? That in a, so I guess, can you talk to the, about the, I guess yeah. the mental aspect, the humbling aspect of that and kind of, you know, maybe some motivation for someone who's trying to, you know, because you, you knew what you really wanted to do. That goes against what you could do. Right. So it's kind of like, Perfect. you know, you know, it was uh, it was scary as shit to use a term of art. <laughs> you know, I had a lot of people who I care about and respect. You say you're a freaking idiot. What are you doing? Whether it was family fr and, and there was a ton of support, but. I mean, yeah, you're spot on that I had the opportunity to walk into, you know, in my mid 20s. Uh, at that time, the white shoe law firms were paying 180,000 base plus bonus. My first job with a mid market developer paid me a third of that. It was, I think it was like 50 or 60,000 my first year. And right, and I'm now a year or maybe even two out by the time I got that opportunity. So, buddies of mine who were doing that had been in these firms for two years and were probably making. 250 plus and here I am taking a first job making 50,000 but it was what I really wanted to do and it was scary and it was certainly humbling I mean I went from and I have like a video that my mother recorded on her iPhone and it, it's, it was one of the coolest moments of my life getting the award at St. John's Law for you know being first in my class and the stadium went crazy and it was the floors were shaking with applause and it was like this high that was then followed by this sort of existential feeling of 
oh my God, what am I going to do next? Because I don't have this cushy law job to walk into by, by choice. Um, and then having to struggle through, as I said, a lot of, you know, rejection, um, right. Where I thought I said, okay, you know, I came out of that experience or that process with graduation and was ready to hit the ground running and had a spreadsheet of all these folks I was going to network with from high school, from college, from law school and day and week and month went by and I met a ton of great people, some of whom I'm close with today in different types of mentorship relationships. And I got that similar response, like I said. So it was humbling, but having arrived, you know, from, from day one when I got that first shot, but more so as that developed and I, you know, attained different successes and now kind of starting a, a development firm and platform on my own, it's super cathartic. And it's just, I, I look back at that experience when I talk to guys like you or, or similarly situated uh, people, you know, my advice is if you have a passion for something, you have a vision for something, you work, you, you know, you can't sit home and, and cross your fingers and, and hope that the Ferrari lands in your lap. You got to be out there working really hard. I mean, a great piece of advice, the first person who gave me the opportunity, that developer who I referenced said to me when I was sitting with him, having the first conversation, I, I cold called, reached out to him and he said, you know, we're sitting in his backyard, five thousand five five million dollar mansion, literally Ferrari in the driveway, and I'm sitting there like, holy shit, this is everything I could ever want. This is the coolest thing ever. Young guy, early forties, and he says, I wake up every day and I look around my mansion and I laugh. How the hell did I end up here? He says, I got really lucky in life, but you have to constantly put yourself in a position to be lucky. And he wasn't he wasn't saying luck like lottery type luck. He meant and he said to me, the fact that you're sitting here, you know, and, and that we're developing this relationship and I ended up go, ultimately going to work for him, you're putting yourself in a position to get lucky, quote unquote, right? So, I, I, you know, I, I, I would say that that's analogous to working hard and getting good grades. You're putting yourself in a position to get lucky, networking and meeting people, you know, doing good internships. All these things we're talking about is putting yourself in a position to get lucky because you need to have a little bit of, of just the universe on your side for some of these, you know, success stories, but to, to get to a place where uh, of true success, and that doesn't just mean, you know, monetary or material, but where you're fulfilled and, and you enjoy what you do every day because you spend a ton of time at work. You need to kind of shut out the, the noise, believe in, 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 you know, yourself and what you know how to do um, surround yourself with people who are supportive and just go for it, man. There's no magic. You just got to go for it. Yeah, that's awesome. I guess to uh, take a little step back, how did you know what you wanted to do? How did you know you wanted to be a developer? So I didn't is the short answer. Um, sometimes I still say I'm trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. But the way, you know, the long story short of how it meandered for me was um, after Fordham. So I wanted to work in finance initially just because I was a naive young guy and seemed like the way to make the most money was to be an investment banker. And I like nice things. Um, so I was a finance major, did really well. The problem was going back to that sort of common thread, Fordham not being a target school and I'm not blaming Fordham, but I did very well, but I struggled to get into like a front office position at a bold bracket bank, whether it was sales and trading or investment banking. Um, had I done more networking at that point, had I done more proper relevant internships that might've been different. Um, because, you know, you, you can't, I, there's guys at, at schools, you know, way below Fordham who achieved great things and, and, and had really great opportunities and experiences. But um, I didn't have that at that point. So I ended up going to work for a small prop trading firm. And this was, I graduated 2011 from college. So not long after the financial crisis and financial regulations were still, were still, you know, developing and progressing coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. So I went to work at a prop trading desk and it was super challenging. You had black box trading and algorithmic trading. And it was, I, I, so, you know, once I settled into the role and I'm sort of sitting there, I felt like I was um, like playing a video game on computers with screens and charts. And it just did nothing for me. I said, you know, I could hit this button and make a million dollars right now. I won't feel any happier than I am right now. I just didn't enjoy doing it. Um, and so I ended up pivoting shortly after that experience and going to law school um, for no other reason than that I had family attorneys, none of whom pressured me during college to, to, to follow a path I wasn't interested in. But once I was expressing the fact that I wasn't sort of happy with what I was doing, I revisited the, the possibility of law school. 
Um, and I applied around and I got you know, a good scholarship at, at a, a very good regional law school called St. John's up here in New York. And so I went and applied myself, didn't know coming out where I was gonna end up, had a feeling that I wasn't going to practice law, but very you know, uh, open to the concept and did a bunch of different internships, tried a bunch of different things, excelled academically as now we've said a few times, um, came out, practiced a little bit in the beginning, um, but was working on, I mean, I mean, the truth of the matter is I was working on a tiny, tiny, tiny real estate project that was literally converting a single family home into a two family home and extending, extending it, it a home that my father owned. Um, doesn't even count as development in any sense of, of the word, uh, but it was, it was the first sort of exposure. And I was practicing some law on one side and I was doing this little pet project on, on the other side, you know, where I'm dealing with an architect and contractors and a lender. And I, I just enjoyed the puzzle of putting it together and seeing this thing, you know, come to life. And that's when I started thinking, wow, if I could do this little project on a larger scale and make a career out of it, this is really, really uh, interesting, exciting, fit my skill set where I'm able to sort of be dealing with different types of people bankers on one hand, construction workers on another. Um, every day was sort of different. And, and, and I, because I, I really got, you know, into thinking about what do I want to do in, a, in my career? What do I want to do every day? What do I want to get out of it? What, you know, heights do I want to be able to achieve? And so once I started understanding the, the development business, um, it just made a whole lot of sense and aligned with a lot of my interests and skill sets. And so I started at that point pivoting towards heavily networking in that area to, to make sure, right? I'm not just going to jump into Now I've tried a couple of different things. I don't want to just jump blindly. And I was educated by this point to what I didn't like and what didn't really suit my personality. Um, and, and that's when I started that heavy networking in, in the real estate space, um, you know, verified that's, that was what I, I loved and was interested in and wanted to do, met the right folks, got to start, and the rest was sort of history. Awesome. So um, what does a developer really do? Because I think when you th think of a developer, everyone's like, okay, developers build buildings. And yeah, like if that was it, just like snap your fingers to buildings there, you know, everyone would be a developer, but uh, clearly it's not that easy and it's, that's not, Great that's not how it goes. So yeah. My, to hear your, my, your my mother still asks me to this day, she says, what do you actually do? I'm always on the phone yelling at somebody and she, she says, what do you do every day? And I just say, it, it's, too difficult to explain. The short, the short, the shortest version of what we do is herd cats. Herd cats, right? Think about a cat that just wanders on its own, does whatever it wants, doesn't care about how you feel about it. Take a hundred of them, and you need to herd them into one direction. That's what we do. Um, we herd cats. The cats are contractors, subcontractors, vendors, consultants, professionals, bankers, tenants, etc. We're coordinating a process, right? You're coming up with a business plan. Um, if you're a builder developer as well, you know, the construction process might be a component of it. Otherwise that's, you know, a, 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 an outsourced um, aspect, but you're coordinating all these processes based upon an investment decision and a business plan. Um, so what is the process? It's identification and origination of a new deal. Find an opportunity, a piece of land, vacant building, something, right? Um, then I need to find out how do I acquire that building, whether it's acquiring the fee simple interest, buying the dirt, or maybe it's the 99 year ground lease or something of that uh, aspect. When I know how I'm gonna acquire it, I need to think about the underwriting for what my business plan is. Does it make sense economically based upon what I buy it for, what I have to spend to either build it or renovate it? And on the other side, what type of revenues will be generated from this investment, right? When I put that together, I think about how am I gonna finance it? How, do, how am I gonna buy it? You don't wanna pay all cash, typically today in a high interest rate environment, you hear some investors paying, you know, doing more cash deals than they might've done, but the big stuff in New York city, I mean, there's always some amount of, of debt involved, right? And maybe you're even syndicating the equity. So if you have a hundred million dollar project, 70 million bucks is going to be debt. Let's say 30 million is going to be equity. That equity could be further syndicated out. So how am I raising the equity for the project? Maybe there's um, zoning entitlements or land use entitlements here in New York. We have something, one of the, one of the few things, that New York City does really well from an administrative bureaucratic standpoint um, is as of right zoning, um, where there, if you're in the right zoning district and you're allowed to build what's called as of right, you don't need to go get site plan approval, anything. You just you know have to get your, your building plans approved and then you pull a permit and you can build. 
Um, so you go through that pro the design process, um, the construction process, whether you'd handle that in-house or if it's outsourced with the contractor. Um, and then if you don't have it pre-leased, there's a lease up phase where you work with brokers and then either a refinance of the construction loan and or a sale and property management comes along with that. So those are, that's sort of the life cycles of a development project. Um, and that's, those are all the different things. So going back to, you know, a, a smaller type shop where you're wearing a lot of different hats, those are the aspects we work on every day. And within that process, we are herding all of those different cats to get the job done. Awesome. Okay. So we are, it clearly is not just building buildings. There's a lot more that goes into it, but to, let's get to the, to the start of the chain. How do you, how do you find a good opportunity? How do you identify some, some opportunity and how do you know it's the right opportunity? That is the golden question, uh, right? If, if there was a simple answer to that, it, this would be really easy, but it, you know, so it depends on your strategy and approach. Um, I am a value add opportunistic developer. So I'm looking for value add propositions, building a building, um, acquiring an undervalued building, potentially utilizing, let's say community facility floor area where there's a bump for additional floor area because I have a relationship with a community facility tenant. Um, so for example, I've done a lot of work in the charter school space, right? Charter schools are sort of quasi public private schools. They're publicly funded, but privately operated, which is why they have tend tended to have a, a great deal of success. Um, they're politically, uh, contested sometimes because of a union issue in New York City where they're non-union operated, but putting that aside for this conversation, um, charter schools fit into this community facility bucket, a floor area. So in New York City, if you have an as of right zoning district where you could build, let's say a 20,000 square foot residential building, but an 80,000 square foot community facility building, community facility is very limiting. It's a mm -hmm. church, it's a school, it's a medical office. Um, a public school is, difficult because they're not going to be your tenants, but a charter school is sort of a private business that that's, would be a tenant and they sign long-term leases. So it's a space that we got into. Um, so if I was taking a potential charter school deal, I, I, and I had a relationship with a school operator who I knew needed to be located in a certain neighborhood. They had a certain number of students, which means they could pay a certain amount of rent. I now have the, the second part of that equation, the revenue side. I know what so I, I know what it would take to either build or renovate based upon construction experiences. And I'm looking for land that fits the right zoning. So you can't do it in an M zone, for example, you can't do it in a C8 zone. So I'm looking for the right zoning district in the right area with the right amount of floor area to fit the number of, of people that need to fit in this building. Um, and, you know, at the right price point. And if I find something in the right neck of the woods, you know, reach out and whether it's with a broker or off market and start having those conversations. Um, so I'm looking for undervalued types of opportunities, having a tenant in hand before, like the charter school is one example of when you might have, you know, a, a pre-leasing type situation, or maybe an industrial relationship. You have a, a, a relationship with an industrial tenant who needs a warehouse and you know, they're going to pay 30 bucks a foot triple net and they need 20 foot ceilings and, you know, 50,000 square feet of building plus another you know, acre of land for outdoor storage and parking. So I know what I'm looking for. I know that in an M1 zone in New York City, that land should be markets maybe, today it's gotten hot, 150 to 200 bucks a foot. So I'm looking for, hey, if I'm constantly on my iPhone calculator doing math when I know how big a building is, and you and I ran some of these quick exercises, right? How big a building is, what the purchase price is, I'm doing simple division, and if I see, oh shit, 90 bucks a foot, I know that that's the right number. I know that that's a good number because I have a good sense of what, you know, market pricing is for different asset classes in different neighborhoods. So I'm looking at a ton of stuff every day from brokerage relationships, loop net, I mean, you name it, driving around um, and finding undervalued assets and or, you know, value add opportunities where maybe I have a relationship with the tenant. Awesome. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I guess to put some more context on this, can you tell us about a deal that you've recently done or your first deal or um, something that kind of, where I guess we're, something where you've you've learned a lot about what it means to be a developer. Sure. So, I've had some really interesting experience and, and good luck so far. Knocking on marble, not wood, but um, with uh, land use actions up here in New York. So it's a little counterintuitive because I just said that New York has as of right zoning, which it does, which a lot of other places don't. Where anything you want to build, you need to go to the city or town or municipality and apply for a site plan approval. In New York, if you're within an as a, 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 if you want to build something in a zoning district that's as of right for that usage, you don't have to do that. 
but there's also a concept of rezoning in New York, right? Where you could take a M zone piece of land where the buildable square footage might be a one at, let's say you have a 20,000 square foot lot with a one X FAR because you're in an M one, you could build a 20,000 square foot building there. But if I'm in the right area, I'm not deep in an M zone, I'm sort of on the fringes where across the street is an R zone residential. And I know that I can rezone to an R6A and get up to a 3X. Now my 20,000 buildable can go up to a 60,000. And if I could buy that land for the same price, because the owner either doesn't know about this or doesn't know how to do it because it's a, it's a lengthy, time-consuming and expensive process. But if I have the right relationships and the understanding that because of where this is situated, um, it would make a lot of sense to take it through a potential rezoning. So if I'm buying it now for a hundred bucks a foot on 20,000 feet, but that basis is worth 30 bucks a foot only if I can rezone it and get three times my floor area, uh, I've just created tremendous value. So um, working on a deal right now that's pending. So without giving you know, specific uh, details or location in, in Queens County in New York, where we're in a contract, I'm in a contingent contract, right? To acquire a piece of land subject to the zoning approval which is, is great because I don't need to actually close on that land until and unless the zoning gets done because I don't wanna buy it in the zoning uh, district that it's currently located. It's like an R2, you could build one or two private family homes. I'm applying for an R6A to be able to build a multifamily apartment building. Good relationship with a council member in this district, good relationship with the community board. I know that rezoned to an R6A, this thing is gonna be worth, the land alone is gonna be worth 200 bucks a foot on the buildable. Um, so I'm spending two years and several hundred thousand dollars, but I don't have to actually close on a multi-million dollar acquisition until and unless I get there. And if I get there, yes, I'm closing, but I've created tremendous value. Um, so I have a, a really exciting project that I'm working on right now. Um, it's one of the main aspects of the portfolio. And that was sort of also the, the launching point for leaving a developer that I was with and starting you know, my own shop at this point and doing it on my own. Um, being pretty far down the path on that project, which is going to be a, a really great one. But um, that aspect right now in this period of high interest rates and where valuations are high to, to spend the time, you know, because I'm very selective on deals being, you know, a small guy and running lean. I'm not doing a ton of deals. I'm trying to do a few really good deals that make a lot of sense. So if you could spend this time right now while the world's a little bit on shaky and the banking sector may or may not be collapsing again, <laughs> Um, to go through sort of the year and a half, two year process to do, um, you know, zoning entitlements, change of zonings, et cetera. It's a really good way to spend the time, create value, weather the storm, you know, and, and see where the world shakes out at that point. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And so I think we're kind of touching on it, but what's unique about developing in New York City and um, where in New York City is you find to be attractive? Yeah, I mean, the as of right zoning I've mentioned is something that's that makes it really I don't know if predictable is the right word, but we'll go predictable for the moment. There's a, there's a process, there's a path, right? I take a piece of land, I can go on Zola, I understand what it's zoned, that, that tells me how big of a building I could build, I know what the lot coverage is, I know what the height cap is, if there is one. Um, and then, you know, I could build out my model, my underwriting, right, based on how big of a building I could build, what do I got to buy it for, what it's going to cost to build it, what type of revenue can I get by looking at comps. Um, so as of right zoning and the predictability that comes with it is, is really crucial in New York. I mean, I love the boroughs. I'm a Queens guy born and raised. I love Queens. It's what I know. It's where I know. I know the markets and different neighborhoods really well. Um, Queens, the Bronx has been really active. Um, Brooklyn as well. Manhattan still scares me personally. Um, you got a lot of guys trying to scoop up, you know, undervalued office product because there's a ton of vacant office buildings. Um, there's a lot of, you know, big push here under the Adams administration in particular, but among others as well. And then Adam, Eric Adams and, and his, his staff has been excellent so far, um, pushing for things like this, but office conversions to residential. The issue is that so far there haven't been any incentives, um, tax abatements, et cetera, to, to kind of help give a little bit more of a push where it's gonna make those deals pencil. But the more pragmatic issue in a lot of, in a lot of senses with office to resi conversion is floor plates. When some of these office buildings are too fat, right? The floors are too big. You can only put dwelling units along window lines. You need windows to be able to have people sleeping, living, et cetera. So if a, if a floor plate is too wide and the apartment's only gonna be along the window line, but you have too much of sort of a you know, core, the building's very inefficient um, and you have a tremendous loss factor. So that's been a large part of the issue. Um, but so yeah, boroughs, baby, Queens. Awesome. And so 
we touched on it a little bit, but what are some difficulties or, you know, what is it like <laughs> to be a developer in this economic climate that we're in? And I guess you mentioned kind of how, how you're approaching it, but um, I guess just to keep it simple, like what causes the difficulty for a developer in this kind of yep. environment? Interest rates are, are tough. Interest rates right now are really tough. You know, I have, you talk to a guy who's been around more cycles than, than me and they might laugh and say, ah, I remember the old days when interest rates were even higher than this. I only know interest rates being effectively zero, right? And I'm not a, a spring chicken, but I'm 34. I only know interest rates being zero um, effectively, you know? So, and when I say zero, you know, not zero, but super low. Yeah, you could basically borrow money for almost free plus a little bit. Um, you know, construction loan financing. Now you're talking 10% from a bank, 12 or 13% from a fund lender, a deal that would have otherwise penciled when you're adding, you know, two X or even three X on debt service, um, interest reserve on a construction loan makes it tremendously more expensive. Construction costs aren't changing. You know, labor costs aren't changing. The only thing that can change to, to, to balance the increased cost of borrowing is decreased cost of land but you're not, we're not really seeing land valuations coming down. Um, sellers are remaining sort of stubborn on pricing. You got to really be selective and patient and look for those good deals. If you buy a deal at the same price that it was a year ago when interest rates were half, it's that much more expensive. You better make sure you're underwriting pencils. And you know, in addition to, to money being more expensive, banks are also putting out less. Um, so you got to have a, a deal that makes sense you know, for your lender that you can, that you can actually borrow, but proceed levels have been a lot lower where typically you might've been able to borrow 65%, you know, LTC loan to cost on a ground up construction project, a bank who still might do that deal. It's going to be more expensive. It might only give you 50%. So if I got a $20 million total capitalization. That means I'm getting, you know, uh, $10 million now where I, I would have had, I would have had several million more to work with in debt, right? Cause the balance has to come from, from equity cash, whether that's your own pocket or syndication among other equity sources. So that's the challenge. Um, it's a real one, but you know, it's a time to be selective, to be patient. Um, I don't know that interest rates are coming, are gonna drop. I, I don't believe they're gonna drop substantially um, because of what happened with inflation. But you know, I think it could be manageable if you, if you have a solid foundational business plan for a property for a development site and you, and you just really make sure and you sort of sensitivity test cap rates and interest rates in your, in your modeling to make sure that, you know, if you have an exit cap at a five rate, a five cap, uh, you better check that at a five and a half and a six and a six and a half to make sure that you're not thinking, oh, I got a 30 IRR project at a five cap. Well, if this thing ends up selling at a six and a half cap, you know, I got a 12 IRR and I just spent two years to make 12% of my money. That might sound great in some other business, but the risk and the, and, and what we, you know, do as developers, that's not a good return for common equity. So those are things you really got to focus on and think about. Absolutely. And so obviously with interest rates higher, lower loan to costs, loan to values, um, you have to raise or provide more equity. And I think that in, especially when you're, I guess, on the earlier side of a career in development that there might be that chicken before the, the chicken or the egg problem of, you know, if you don't have a track record, it's hard to raise equity, but if you, but then how do you get a track record if you or yeah, how do you get a track record if you can't raise equity, right? Yeah. But then there's also the, the aspect of um, that does a <laughs> good deal drive the equity or, or, or in, your, in your experience, if you have a good deal, is, does the money come? Or is it much, much harder than that? 100%. I mean, it, it, it's relationships. In the beginning, and this is something I'm experiencing now, uh, it's relationships, right? Different folks bring different things to the table. If I could put together and tie up a really good deal that makes a lot of sense with a really solid business plan and a really solid underwriting, I'm going to go call two, three, five different, you know, co-GP partners on a, on a joint venture and say, hey, guys, here's what I'm bringing to the table. I got this site locked up. Maybe I have a tenant, whatever the case may be, you know, I can write this amount of cash. I need you to fill this gap in the equity. Maybe if it's a 90, 10 deal and 80, 20, um, depending upon what the scenario might be. So first it's relationships to know who to go, who to go to and to have, you know, those people you can have those conversations with um, other developers and, 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 you know, capital partners. But then secondly, and equally as important is the deal's got a pencil. It's got to make a lot of sense, especially now, when same way banks are selected putting out money, so, so are equity sources, whether it's co-GP partners, 
or just institutional LP, um, you know, they want to put money out because they have to. These guys, just like banks, right? These guys can't sit and do nothing. They can't just leave their money in depository accounts. They, the, the job of a bank is to, is to put money out. And same thing with an LP. And co-GP partners want to do deals. Um, so it's finding and putting together good deals. So again, it, it is a little bit sick, cyclical and chicken or the egg. But for someone like in my position, my focus is pound the pavement, identify solid deals, make sure they pencil really well. Um, and then, you know, think about the right partnership to go to, because it's not just a matter of writing the checks. You also need to sign guarantees, especially if a construction project. Um, you might need, you know, X dollars of net worth and X dollars of liquidity in an operating account um, to sign a guarantee. So having, having partners who can, who can do that is, is super important. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I also would, I think that the, um, a lot of LPs, the managers make their fees when they deploy the capital. So there is a prerogative to, to get the money out. So, but, um, but obviously there's needs to be the right deal. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess if you don't mind, I loved hearing your story about your first day as a, at a developer working with a developer. Um, and I just wanted to bring it back to, to that before we go to the lightning round, because um, sure. you know, it's, it was mo it's inspiring, motivating, and uh, you know, it's, it shows what, what it takes. So. Yeah, look, I'll, uh, it's it's embarrassing is not the word because I don't get embarrassed, but it's humbling. But I, I love the story and I gladly tell it. Um, my fir first you know, developer I worked for was a, a small you know, mid-market guy, but super active, really savvy, really well connected. Um, lean, lean shop, not a lot of employees at all. Um, and, and I sort of, I wouldn't go so far as to say pled for a job, but I, I really, you know, hounded this guy in an appropriate and professional way and let him see that I wanted this bad. So he gave me a shot and he was the first person who did when others, others were really reluctant to. And when we had that conversation, he said, listen, I'm getting really busy. Why don't you come, come on down on Monday morning, you know, 8 AM. And, and I don't know what you're going to do, but we'll figure it out. So we sit in his office and he goes, okay, a couple of things to cover. First of all, what do you need to get paid? And I go, um, I said, how about I work for free? And he laughed and I, and I sat there straight face and he goes, what do you mean? I said, seriously, I know that there's a little bit of hesitation because even though you, you like each other and you, you know that I'm a hard worker, and you know, the academic background, I also know that I don't know how to do this and that you're going to need to teach me. Um, so how about I work for free to prove myself? He almost fell out of his chair. I mean, he tells this story to this day. He's a cl close friend and mentor of mine. Um, and he was floored by the fact that I would even see, see, say that and recognize the fact that he's going to be you know, spending a ton of resources, dollars, and his own personal time to teach me. I mean, there's, there's people who've said, and some of the guys who said to me when I was networking, you should offer these guys to pay them for the opportunity to come work for them. And, and, you know, that's being facetious, but the concept is that you're not adding any value on day one. Um, I ended up not working for free, but it, that made a huge impression when I said that. That was my first day. And, um, and, it, you know, it, it, it gave him an understanding of where my head was at and the fact that I just wanted this. I wanted a shot, right? But so once we got over that, that point and we agreed to a small amount of money that paid my bills, I was living with my parents at the time. I said, okay, what am I going to do? He goes, I don't know. You don't really know how to do anything. And he goes, see this stack of papers over here? I said, yep. He goes, well, I parked my Aston Martin downstairs. Our office was in Tribeca. But the parking garage is too far. I parked the car here. I get a ticket every few days. I haven't had time to pay these tickets. Some of them are in collection. Um, I need you to figure this out. So I said, okay. And I'm telling you, I was so eager to do anything just to be a fly in the wall, to be there, to listen, to learn, to literally be the guy, uh, a, a smart guy, not to digress, but a smart guy who I knew who worked in finance, who, um, worked for a really big, worked for Lehman brothers and then a really big hedge fund that now has his own and is super successful. Baruch college guy once told me a story similar. He goes, when I worked at Lehman, I was got in and I went to Baruch and it was not a target school. He goes, my approach was if somebody dropped a pen, I would dive on the floor to pick it up. Anything I could do to be helpful, right? Should be sort of the mentality when you're getting started. Um, so anyway, I literally spent my first several days parsing through this tall pile of Aston Martin DB9 parking tickets, many of which were in collections. It was like $20,000 in parking tickets. I was calling collection agencies and I just was doing it as well as it, this job could be done, this task, right? And at the end of the week, and there were other things sprinkled in, of course, and that, that wasn't all that I did, but um, I knew that it was important to him and causing him stress, right? So I, I put my heart and soul into this. At the end of the week, it was Friday. I never forget, I have the email still. And I should one day I'm going to frame this email. 
I, it's like 10 o'clock at night on a Friday night. I'm still in the office because I was there late. And I sent him this long, elaborate email detailing everything I had done, all the results, you know, these 17 tickets I got cleared, these 35 I negotiated a lower price, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And his response was, holy shit, if you do everything that you do like this, you're going to do just fine. Um, and, and, and again, I, I think I said to you, any task that you're given in the beginning, and this goes, I, I'm a strong believer in life. Anything you're going to do, if it's worth doing, do it well um, and do it to the best of your ability. So I did a bunch of menial tasks in the beginning. I quickly proved myself, though, because, you know, what, what, what that person told me was he said, the fact that you did this so well, the level of trust and confidence I have in you just grew exponentially. And that's going to keep happening as you keep doing tasks well, more important tasks as time goes on um, to the point where, you know, at the end, I was effectively running this business, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of real estate investments and development projects. And that allowed me sort of the springboard to, to jump to, to doing this stuff on my own at this point. So paying parking tickets to the best of your ability. Um, less than yeah, man. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. And um, I guess just the, the, the point that I take away, and I guess the philosophical point is that like, my, everything you do, everything I do is a reflection of myself. That's like to not do something the, the way to, to the excellence I expect of myself would be to be un, untrue to myself. That's like everything I, the way I approach the world is, is who I am to the world. And, and to do anything less than is to be less than. And so I just, sure. and I have, I know just like really quick, another friend who's in a totally different business would tell me similar example to what we're talking about when he would interview somebody, he'd have them, you know, wait, and he'd go out the back door and he'd go look at their car in his parking lot to see how neat or messy their car, just look in the windows. Um, because things like that tell you a lot about somebody, you know, what you do when nobody's watching reflects upon, you know, your whole, your whole, whole outlook on life and, and approach and work ethic and, and all that good stuff. So really important. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess to take it, that's the beginning, take to the end. What is your, yep. your dream? What is your, what is What do you <laughs> see? Who are you in? I don't know. At, at the end of the day, when you get to look back, I guess, uh, are you, do you have a, a the tallest sky rise on 57th or, or, or is it some, Not, something different? Yeah. I like to do, I want to do cool deals, interesting deals. I want to have autonomy to do what I enjoy doing with the people I enjoy doing it with. Um, my, my company is called Apex Development Group. It's new. I've been, you know, operating under it for the past couple of years, but now really, you know, solo with it. Um, I want to grow it. I want to have good partnerships. I want to do good projects. Doesn't need to be the sexiest. Doesn't need to change the New York City skyline. Sure, that would be cool, but that's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's doing something that I enjoy doing with people. I like doing it every day. Hopefully a little bit of money comes along with that. Hopefully, you know, I newly married um, just over a month, um, you know, so family life develops in the right way and friendships and, and different relationships. You and I just met and I'm, I'm happy to have, have had that opportunity. So um, I want to do what I like to do with people I like to do it with and hopefully have a lot of years ahead. Awesome. Well, that sounds the dream. Well, you ready for the lightning round? Sure. All right. What superpower would you want if you could have any superpower? Superpower. Um, so it's, it, this is also sort of counterintuitive because I like, the reason I love what I do in real estate and development is, is sort of the mind, the, the mental aspect of it. Um, but having the ability to know somebody else, somebody else's thoughts, like in a negotiation, right? And partially that takes all the fun out of the job. So I, I don't know that I really mean that, but from a purely, you know, pragmatic standpoint towards being productive in business to be able to know what my adversary was thinking um, from a negotiation standpoint. Yeah, awesome. Guess um, sometimes they might not even know what they're thinking. That would be interesting to know though. <laughs> that's true. Very <laughs> often times that's the case, unfortunately. Right. So, uh, so what's your favorite book or what's the one that's helped you the most? A lot of good ones. I like to read about successful people, um, to hear different stories. Um, as you could probably see, cause I sprinkle in like little things that different folks have taught me who I respect, but, um, something I read early, I think it was in college, not high school, maybe a couple of times, how to win friends, and influence people. Dale Carney. Um, again, part of, part of the theme here, right. Is, is networking and relationships and, likability, but that's too simple. It really being able to connect with people um, and, and to develop trust 
is, is hugely important in, in any business, but you know, real estate in New York City can be can be scrappy and there's a lot of colorful characters and being able to connect with people is hugely important. So I love, among many others, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, I love it too. The favorite thing that I remember every single day um, for that book is answer the phone with a smile. That's right. I love it. Right. So yeah, what, what motivates you to continue every day? Uh, right now it's growing this, this platform, right? Um, at one point it was learning the business, kind of got to that point. After that, it was growing the business I was with. Now it's sort of growing my own and taking it to the next level. Um, so it's been, it's, it's a relatively new venture, but something I'm super excited about. The market's a little bit scary. The interest rates are a little bit scary, but you know, nothing worth doing ever came, came easy, as they say, not to use a cliche. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to. Gotcha. So what advice would you want to give to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? Don't follow the crowd. Don't be afraid of rejection. Don't be afraid when, you know, all your friends and sometimes family are telling you you're not making a smart decision, unless of course it's something harmful to yourself or others. But from a business professional standpoint, you know, if you've spent decades of life becoming, you know, an intelligent person and you, you think about the reasons for the things that you do and, and the things you want to do, you, you got to stay true to that and go with it and, and persevere through whatever, whatever that takes, you know, intelligently, of course, but um, that's what I'd recommend. Awesome. Well, I love that. So since I put you on the spot, I want to give you a chance for revenge. So what's a question you have for me? So new, I know part of, you know, part of our, and I've alluded to it, we've spoken a couple of times and, you know, it's a new relationship and an interesting one to me because I think you're uh, got a uniquely great head on your shoulders for, for a guy your age. Um, sort of a simple one, but where do you see yourself in 10 years, right? And that gives you a little bit of, so I, I, I typically, when it's more than one question is, you got you to break that down. So you got to go one year, five years, and then sort of 10. Those are sort of the gaps, right? But fast forward to 10, be a little bit of a starry-eyed dreamer. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's simple because I, I, don't, I don't think about, because the, the, the way I would be externally could have so many different forms, right? What I'm doing, how I'm doing it, where I'm doing it with who I'm doing it. Could, oh, yep. not with who. That's the, that's the one thing that I might know. But um, there's a lot of things that I'm, ways that it could look, but I know the things that I want to, to the way I want to be at that point. So I guess leading up to 10 years or so, along the journey, it will be a constant journey of growth and learning more and perfecting myself. And the way I define success, I think my, for the rest of my life, at least for as long as I've been thinking about what I want to do with, with my life. It, it's been, yep. uh, it's been every day getting better, right? That what I am is, is learning success is being on an uphill battle or not uphill battle, but being on an uphill trajectory and um, continuing to move up. But in terms of where I want to be in 10 years, I want to have, I want to own r enough real estate to have some um, stability in terms of income generated passively that I'm not, I'm no longer trading my time for the money I need to do the basics that I want to have. So I guess in 10 years, I'm expecting to be in a place where I'm starting a family, um, or at least I want to be in a place where I can start a family. So that probably in includes, I'll, I don't know how you, if you want to do this inflation adjusted, but maybe uh, like $200,000 or I don't know, to five, at least $500,000, somewhere in that range of passive income yep. that allows me to know, okay, now I have the money that I can, I have a house, I can pay my bills, I can spend as much time with my wife and maybe my my kids that I want. And that gives me the mental clarity, the flexibility to continue to have the freedom in my life that I want. Maybe if you go to the beach for a month and read Plato and then come home and be a better, a better, you know, developer, dad, husband, everything. That's whatever it is. Right. So yeah. That's how I see it. And um, I think I'm on cool. on the right trajectory, just learning every day. Definitely. Awesome. Well. Of course, it's always a pleasure to speak, Andrew, and um, this is no exception. It's it's great to learn more and I hope people, everyone listening, learns a lot from this conversation and uh, motivates them to think about what they really want to do and what it will take and um, your uh, role model to me and hopefully many others. So I appreciate you taking yeah, I'm time. Yeah, look, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, if, if colleagues, friends of yours, listeners, you know, 
want to ever chat or just pick my brain or do some networking. Love that stuff. Always find time for it, even though life's busy. So I'm definitely happy to make myself available to continue, you know, both with you, of course, but others in your network as well. Of course. Well, I encourage anyone to reach out and Andrew and everyone listening, keep making milestones. Before you go, I just wanted to say thanks again for tuning in to another awesome episode of Real Estate Milestones. If you've been enjoying the show and you'd like to offer your support, please leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's the best way to increase the show's visibility and help the message get out to a greater audience. I really appreciate your time and support and keep making milestones. The information provided on this podcast is intended to be educational and informational only and is not considered to be formal legal advice. The listener should not take or refrain from taking action based on its content. Any listener in need of legal opinion upon which to rely in decision-making should consider formally engaging an attorney to review relevant facts in detail and examine the pertinent law as it applies to those facts.